Good evening, everybody. Today is Sunday, September 26, 2021. Today we're doing a caseless defense webinar. Um, I'm Zoe Million. Um, just to let you know, I'm having some Wi-Fi issues, so if I lose you guys, I'll try and log on back on. Um, I was having some issues yesterday. Today I've been doing okay, but uh, I'll stay on the line. I'll try and uh, get back to you if, if I lose you. So with a show of hands, does anybody have any questions about anything up to this point? Anybody have any questions? Okay, anybody wanna participate and be on the hot seat? Okay, Sasha, you have your hands up here. Says yourself, Hello. can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, perfect. Hello? Well, now that's better. All right, did you turn in your uh, okay. list? I did. It's under Howard. Oh. Howard, okay. Hold on. Let's look for it. Any specific case you're interested in? Nothing specific. Specific. I've done an OB case so far. Okay. So what I would you like to do? Anything from Office or GYN? Okay. I'm just looking for a case. Bear with me. Okay. Just trying to make it also bigger for everybody to see it. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> you can't see my screen, right? No. Okay, I'll show it here in a second. Case number 10. So explain to me how you discussed with the patient her options in regards to her treatment for her vaginal atrophy? Um, the patient's a 69-year-old G2P2, um, came in um, with complaints of vaginal atrophy. Um, on exam, I found that um, it was also consistent. So let me interrupt you a second. Can I interrupt you a second? So she oh, walked yes. in saying have vaginal atrophy? Well, you're right. No, she complained of vaginal dryness. Um, and um, some pain with intercourse. Okay. Um, so on, sorry. No, no, continue. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, so on exam, um, it was um, found that the vaginal tissue did look atrophic and she did experience um, discomfort even with the pediatric speculum on exam. And so when you say that the, the vaginal the vagina looked atrophic. What did it look like? Can you be more specific and tell me what you saw? Yeah, um, the tissue was more kind of um, a brighter red instead of the pale pink. Um, mucosa, the tissue appeared dry in the areas that didn't have the lubricant on it from the speculum, so more of the sidewall areas. And so when we had um, proceeded, obviously at this point in time, we had ordered her mammogram that day. Um, she did not have the results that day. As you see, she has a BIREDS 4 and ended up going through a breast biopsy, which was benign. Um, but at that so time... Can you tell me, the, can you tell me the, the BIREDS classification system? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, zero is um, inconclusive, so you would want further imaging. One means there was no um, concerns. Um, six is a biopsy-proven um, uh, biopsy proven cancer. Uh, four is suspicious, five is very suspicious, um, two also um, benign findings, and um, three kind of inter intermediate or indeterminate, but likely not okay. suspicious. Okay, continue with. Uh, so when we had, 
um, discussed in the office that there are several options that she could do for her vaginal atrophy. I like to start with the um, kind of least invasive to the most invasive. And by least invasive, I mean um, non-prescription over-the-counter stuff. I judge what she has done previously. So at this point in time, she had tried um, KY jelly, a, a water-based lubricant. Um, we discussed whether she wanted to do um, a silicone-based lubrication um, because she was complaining that they had to use so much of the water-based lubricant and it wasn't lasting for the duration of intercourse. So she left that day with um, wanting to try the silicone-based lubricant. Um, other than that, we also talked about some natural lubrications like coconut oil, um, vaginal, vaginal estrogen, which we can do the um, conjugated equine estrogens versus the estradiol. Um, I get better coverage with the estradiol vaginal tablets um, just in the vagina twice a week. I usually do the 10 microgram. Um, I offered her all of those options, knowing that none of it's overnight. So if she ever changed her mind and wanted to move forward with that, it's not a treatment that we would expect um, returns that day. So it would take some time with the vaginal estrogen to help um, treat the atrophy. So usually expected about four weeks before she notices a significant. So how do you instruct a patient to use a vaginal estrogen? Let's say a Premarin cream. How do you instruct a patient to use the product? A half a gram. There's a couple of different um, options that you can use. I know um, some people do more of a uh, quote unquote like loading dose where they do um, every night for a week and then bump down to twice a week. Um, considering how much atrophy she had, that would definitely have been an option or just twice a week. Um, I usually tell them to pick um boring nights that they don't plan to be sexually active because I wouldn't want her to have intercourse right after placing a vaginal cream because that's going to expose her partner to estrogen and it's going to defeat the purpose. It's going to it's going to lose more of the medication. And um, so you're saying using it twice a week. Why only twice a week? Um, typically, um, I want to do less than 50 micrograms per the vagina um, to decrease the chance that it's going to get into her bloodstream. Um, like a systemic HRT because that has a very different risk profile. So how do you counsel the patients in regards to the, that profile? Um, typically, if it's less than 50 micrograms per week, it's not going to do the same as the systemic hormone replacement therapy, aka like going through the um, um, first pass metabolism, like when you take an oral HRT and the theoretical risk, even with the topical or even with the risks of the topical hormone replacement therapy, you're going to have that increased risk of breast cancer, uterine cancer, abnormal vaginal bleeding, um, increased risk in your or increase in your clotting factor, so PEs, DVTs. Um, but the vaginal estrogen, if it's less than 50 micrograms, doesn't get in the vagina or doesn't get in the bloodstream and doesn't put her at the same risks. So let's say this patient has a history of breast cancer. Would you give her uh, intravaginal estrogen? So it's not completely contraindicated. We have a few patients who um, are on that therapy with close um, counseling by myself as well as their breast oncologists. It depends on their the patient's comfort level as well as the oncologist as well as her diagnosis. If she had a triple negative breast cancer, it wouldn't even play a factor. Any other treatment options that are available to the patient. Um, if there's more than just the vaginal atrophy, because a lot of the times people I find who have vaginal atrophy also have pelvic floor dysfunction because they have avoided intercourse for so long that sometimes vaginal dilators and pelvic floor physical therapy can be used in conjunction. What if the patient tells you, you know, doctor, you know, I'm tired of using the lubricants. I'm really not interested in any hormonal treatment. Is there a med other medical treatments that would be beneficial? Um, you can use the um, the new the Osfina, the serum as well, as well as the um, Intrarosa, which is the um, but those are both going to be medications. But the the oral serum is going to top it target the vaginal tissues and um, help with atrophy. Um, because it's locally converted, as well as the intrarosa, which is a steroid that's locally converted to estrogen and DHEA. 
Okay. Now, what's the most uh, predominant cell in a postmenopausal woman's vagina? So there's definitely a decrease in the lactobacillus. Is that what we're? I don't know that Just I. Just looking. What's the most? What's the most common cell? I, I don't know. know if I know the answer to that. I'm sorry, I don't and, know. Okay, and what would be the, you, you know, roughly the pH of a postmenopausal woman's vagina? It's going to be more basic, and you're going to have um, is it more parabasal cells. I'm not. I would have to look that up to be sure. So, what's a parabasal cell? You know, I would just. I'll definitely have to look that up. That just something that popped into my mind, but I can't recall specifically. So, what's the recommendation in regards to um, performing DEXA scans? When um, should an individual get a DEXA scan? Because I see you ordered a DEXA scan on the patient. Yeah, surprisingly, she hadn't had one previously, but normally I would start at age 65 unless I did a FRAC score that showed that she was at an elevated risk based on, you know, her age, her mother's family history. If she were on um, steroids daily, been diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, had a previous um, fragility fracture, or drank more than three alcoholic beverages a day routinely, um, because that's going to put her at an increased risk. If she had a FRAC score elevated of, I believe it's 8.4 higher, I would order her an earlier DEXA scan. And um, in what situation, let's say you had a patient who was 60 years old and came in, hey, I want a DEXA scan, would you do it? I would evaluate her risk factors, and if she had an elevated FRAC score, then I would, or if she did not, I would tell her that right now there's no um, indication for her to have one, and we would recommend it at 65. And uh, what amount of calcium should this patient be on daily? So she should be on, since she's 69, um, 1,200 milligrams of calcium a day, and her vitamin D should be at 800 international units. Um, let's say she was uh, 40 years old. What would be the vitamin D recommendation? 600. So 600 if she was 40, 800 if she was 69. Oh, no, Correct? sorry. It's it, over 70. It should be. It should be the 800. I misspoke. Okay, so how much uh, vitamin D should this patient be on? So sh she should have 600 international units. So what is a T-score? A T-score is on the um, DEXA scan. It's used mostly to um, compare your bones to a young, healthy um, person. And so that's going to be better for bone aging or looking at a young person's DEXA scan if they're if you're worried about um, um, premature bone loss because you're going to compare it to a young healthy person versus if you're looking at a z-score which is comparing to someone of her peers um, then it's going to be more helpful so um, what's the definition of osteopenia or decreased it, it, when you get a, a DEXA score back when it's from negative one to negative 2.4, and then more than negative 2.5 or 2.5 is going to be osteoporosis. So um, let's say this patient has a DEXA scan that shows a, um, a minus 2.7 in one of one of the locations. Yeah. How, what would you what would you tell the patient? How would you manage your what would you do? Typically in our institution, we have an endocrinologist, so I'll call her and tell her that she does meet um, diagnosis for osteoporosis, and we would like to talk to her about medications, as well as ensuring that her home is safe, that there's no tripping hazards, um, do OTPT if she had any ambulatory issues that put her at a high fall risk, making sure all of her 
um, you know, belongings that she uses on a daily basis is more at eye level, uh, making sure there's no balance issues. We would recommend weight bearing exercises as well as the calcium and the vitamin D along with um, treatment options. Usually first line, if she didn't have any contraindication would be a bisphosphonate. Um, if she didn't have any um, peptic ulcer disease, or um, was unable to stay upright 30 minutes after um, taking it. Those would be big reasons um, that you couldn't use the bisphosphonate. Can you still hear me or did I lose signal? Hello. Are you there, Sasha? Hello? Hello? Okay. Can Are you, you there? Me? I lost you guys, right? Yeah. I'm so sorry. Oh, you, it's you, okay. can see, you, you can't see right now. Hold on. Can you see now? Yes. Okay. I'm so sorry, but I oh, think we're okay. good. Okay, so... um. You said in your institution, there's an endocrinologist? Yeah, so typically- I'm every, sorry, I'm not repeating that. Oh yeah, so typically at our institution, we, since we have an endocrinologist, we do refer um, to talk about treatment options, um, but typically I also talk to them about their adequate, you know, calcium, vitamin D, making sure they um, don't have any tripping hazards, that they have slide on safe shoes, and that everything that they need to get is on an eye level so they're not worried about bending over, standing up, getting dizzy, falling, doing everything we can to decrease their fall risk. PTOT, if they have any balance issues or to work on their strength or a personal trainer to help with weight bearing exercises also helps. And then for medication therapy, typically the first line would be something like a bisphosphonate if she didn't have any contraindications like peptic ulcer disease or inability to sit upright um, for 30 minutes after she takes it. 
I know one of the other options would be something like ProLeo, which is a monoclonal antibody for the rank ligand, and she can do those injections every six months. Um, so, um, so usually first line is, what did you say again first line is? A, a bisphosphonate, if she can tolerate that. And then what's the mechanism of action of a bisphosphonate? I believe it decreases osteoclast activity. Okay. Let's stop there. What do you think? Oh, that was tough. I was sweating with every question. Oh, you did good. I thought you did good. Um, by rats, uh, unless I'm mistaken, there's only five categories. You said there were six. Six is biopsy proven. So they okay, don't okay, gotcha. Because I, I have it to category five as a high likelihood of cancer, greater than 95%. Okay. Yeah. And then category four, suspicious for cancer. Three, probably benign, uh, less than 2% likelihood of cancer. You recommend follow-up in six months. Category one and two are benign findings, and category zero is incomplete. You have it on your list, so they can ask you about it. Um, uh, the pH of a postmenopausal woman's vagina is greater than six, and the predominant cell is a parabasal cell. I did, so did get that parabasal. right. <laughs> yeah. So it no, occurs no, because no, epithelium no. is not fully glycogenated, may be confused with dysplastic cells due to an immature appearance. A parabasal cell is the smallest epithelial cell seen in a typical vaginal smear. It is round or nearly round and have a high nuclear to cytoplasmic ratio. Okay. Um, you corrected yourself. The uh, vitamin D is if you're greater, the last time I checked, if you're greater than 72 years of age, then it's 800 international units. Anything less than that is 600 international units, and then um, your 1,200 for the postmenopausal for your calcium. I thought your uh, discussion of the T score was good. You brought in the Z score. Um, you know, what I've understood in regards to the FRAX calculation, unless something's changed, is a 10 year probability of a hip fracture, a major osteoporotic fracture greater than 9.3%. You had said 8.4, I think. Yeah, there's um if something has changed. Well, we had one lecture earlier that said eight point four, then okay. our lecture in person said nine point three. So I just really don't know what to say. So I thought let's go. I don't, low know, I don't then... think I don't think there's an there's a uh, practice bulletin that would discuss that. Um so I'm sure there's an osteoporotic society you could look up what their recommendations okay. are. I'll do that. You know, and you could always say if somebody questions it like, well, well, I looked up the osteoporosis. I mean, sure, there's some menopause society or osteoporosis society. Everybody has a society, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and you can look that up. And you and it, in essence, I'm not saying you're wrong. You just have to defend what you're saying or why you do what you do. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and the mechanism of action of bisphosphonate is correct. Inhibits bone resorption via action on osteoclasts. And and your prolia was correct. I remember. You know, I remember that from when I studied way back when. Um, other questions? And you think the vaginal atrophy treatments were okay? Yes. Okay. And I, and I was like, because I was waiting for the uh, osphena and stuff like that. That's why I said, well, let's say the patient doesn't want hormones. She doesn't want to use a lubricant. Now, you had said initially in regards to the appearance of the vaginal atrophy, and you had said the the vagina is is more bright red is that what you said yeah but is that the case with atrophy the atrophy is going to be more you know they're going to be lost or rugae it's yeah. going to be more lighter pink right mm -hmm. you know it won't be red yeah i felt it as it was coming out of my mouth but i couldn't take too many things back yeah. So no, but I can't, I can't say. I mean, that's. I mean, that, that I was like, oh, I don't know. But I think overall, you did a good job. Okay, thank you. Okay, other questions? No, and I'll look it up, and hopefully by the end of the lecture, I can tell everybody what the frac score thing is. All right, cool. Is. Let us know. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. All righty. Um, I see that uh, Pardis has her hand up. It says you're self muted, Pardis. Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. All right. And you turned in your um, list? I do. It should be okay. in there. Okay. And do you have a particular case? I just turned off my screen so I could look at it and nobody sees things, I guess. Um, just keep everything as uh, anonymous yep. as possible. 
Um, I'm sorry, say again? You can pick. Um, I don't have a perfect. Okay. Any particular um, category? I would case, say list. <laughs> maybe OB would be better. Are you a generalist or a specialist? I'm a fellow. I'm an REI fellow. Okay, so OB it is. <laughs> okay, hold on. The computer is frozen here a second. Okay. I'm just looking at your list here and making it bigger for everybody to see when I open everything up. Just looking. Case number 10. So let's say um, this patient presents with the butt delivery. What do you do? So um, obviously at that point, um, a patient is being seen in the triage, we need to immediately transfer her to the operating room. I'll be talking to her about the fact that given the fact that um, we have um, the buttock um, presenting, we can go ahead and proceed with um, reach delivery of the baby, however, I will be counseling her towards, um, meaning I will be counseling her that there could be some increased risk of potential injuries um, to the baby with, with, with the breach delivery. Um, if, and you said that she's coming in with breach. Yeah, the buck's, the buck's coming out. You can't, okay. There's no time to do a C-section. So how do you deliver a breach? So I'll be also not notifying the staff and the um, anesthesia that we're going to the OR for a breach um, delivery. And the OR will be um, basically pretty much hands off and coaching the patient through um, the pushing efforts um, until at the, at the baby is delivered until to the level of the umbilicus. When um, we get to that level at that point, um, I'll attempt the delivering of the feet um, by um, basically placing two fingers on the bony parts of the hips and uh, reaching for the popliteal fossa um, and um, rotating and delivering each leg. At that point, I'll be asking for a blue towel. Um, so you said you said you said you would grab the popliteal fossa. I wouldn't. Uh, I would put my reach there and like put a little bit of pressure and um, bring the leg medially and out um, to deliver the leg on each side. Oh, the leg. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Continue. At that point, uh, I'll be asking for a um, blue towel and maybe if there is an assistant to hold. Um, the, the baby's bottom and with a blue towel. I will um, ask the mom to continue with the pushing efforts um, until we reach to the level of the scapula. We'll make sure at that point we um, rotate the baby so the uh, shoulders are in the anterior posterior um, axis and then reach for the arms, in this case, I'll be uh, feeling for the anti-cubital um, fossa and trying to deliver each hand. Um, I will rotate the baby. What's that maneuver called? Love set maneuver, I believe. And the maneuver for the legs? Canard. Okay, continue. Um, and rotate the baby, deliver the other hand. Uh, the final thing would be to deliver the head. Um, at that 
time we need to assist with the flexion of um, the head. So I'll be reaching for the maxilla and put two fingers on each maxilla, trying to flex the head. Um, and in the meantime, with my other hand, I'll be um, putting pressure in the pubic area or on the occiput to help um, deliver the head. Um, hopefully the head will deliver. So what's the name of that maneuver? MSV maneuver, I believe. I'm sorry? Um, I, it's like there is an abbreviation. I believe it's an a MSV. Um, okay. That's the maneuver. So let's say the head is uh, does not deliver. What would you do? I would, um, I forgot to mention that I would uh, always in the circumstances ask for Piper forceps to be ready in the OR just in case I need it. Then I would attempt for placement of the Piper forceps. Um, so how do you place Piper forceps? With, um, that wouldn't be something that I'm the most comfortable with doing. So at that point, I've called the second OBGYN who is comfortable and placing those, but um, I believe so how- they're not, they're not available. What would you do? I will be um, basically putting my hand in along the ba baby's um, head and try to place the um, left blade um, on first and slide it and then slide the right one and then lock it. I'll make sure that um, sometimes for the Piper forceps, you have to be like on knees um, just to be on the lower level from the way that you're de uh, delivering and um, pulling down basically. So let's say the head isn't trapped because of the cervix. Would the Piper forceps help you? It won't. Um, and it usually happens in the setting of if you're having a premature baby. So the baby kind of like uh, was delivered without um, the cervix being fully dilated. In that case, I might consider uh, making dorsal incision. And how do you do that? Dorsal incision usually plays three um, incisions on the cervix at 10, 2, and 6 o'clock. And that's basically if there is any dissociation with the cervix to, re to release that and avoid the vascular area of the cer cer cervix, that's where the cervical branch of the uterine artery goes to the cervix at 3 and 9 o'clock. So why wouldn't you cut at 12? I believe that's, that might be because there could be an extension to the uterus, but I'm not certain. You always fix a uterus, right? Uh, getting into the bladder as well, so you're avoiding that. So let's say the Dursen's incision doesn't help you. What, what would you do next, or what can you do? Um, if we have tried already the Dursen's, um and the forceps and it hasn't helped the and uh, well, let, me, let me go back so let's say the reason that the head's entrapped is because the cervix was not fully dilated the okay. piper forceps won't help correct correct you said that so why would yeah. you put the pipers if that was the cause if you have uh, a head yeah. entrapment because of the cervix why would you put piper forceps on Sorry, I didn't think I initially realized that was the reason. Um, so, if that was the, if the cervix was the cause, then I would do the dorsens. You first. assumed, you assumed you needed the pipers. I never said that. You would make that assumption. Was that an appropriate assumption? Correct. I'm sorry. Okay. So, is there anything else you can do if the dorsens incision does not release the head? At this point, I will be considering doing an ultrasound and see if there are any concerns for fetal head anomalies and things like that that could be contributing. Um, and my next step probably as at this point is going to be um, doing a laparotomy and maybe doing direct pressure, using a direct pressure to see if that would help in delivering the head. Okay, now was an external cephalic version, I'm gonna go back to the case you have on your list, was an external cephalic version offered to this patient? 
Yes, um, we I counseled her towards external cephalic version, which uh, at our institution we usually do at 37 weeks, and um, this patient declined it. And what are contraindications to an external cephalic version? Any contraindications for a vaginal delivery would be a contraindication to external cephalic version. For example, if you're having a placenta previa, uh, um, that would be a contraindication. If there is any malformations of the uterus, like for a corneate or unicorneate uterus, that uh, can be also a contraindication to doing aversion. Um, Algohydramnios is a relative contraindication. If there is um, concern for IUGR, um, that could be also a relative contraindication to attempting an ECV. What if she uh, was going to go, was a prior C-section? Is that a contraindication? It's not a contraindication, no. Can you discuss for me how you perform an external cephalic version? Yes. So, um, like I mentioned, we usually plan to do it at 37 weeks of gestation. Um, it's usually done in a labor and delivery room. Um, usually in instruct the patient BNPO after midnight the night before that she's presenting to the hospital. Upon admission, she will get admission labs done, meaning um, including a type and screen. Um, we will, uh, I, I usually will confirm the presentation doing an ultrasound, get an NST, just to make sure the patient's not actively in labor and contracting and as um, the baby is, um, fetal heart rate is reassuring. Um, we, like I typically do it as like a two to three person um, procedure. Um, I forgot to mention that I, again, counsel the patient towards the risks and benefits of doing the ECV um, and kind of going over the procedure in the room. Um, I offer a regional anesthesia with an epidural to all the patients to see if that's something that they're interested in and um, as something that I typically do before the procedure. Um, I go with administration of terbutaline, given the fact that it has been shown that it increases um, the chance of success. Um, we uh, obviously usually uh, administer some sort of mineral oil to the patient's abdomen. I usually do it um, with the assistance or guidance of the ultrasound one um, person will be holding the breech and elevating the breech from the um, pelvis and the other one will be uh, guiding the head. We will try a forward uh, somersault or a backward um, somersault roll depending on which uh, lie, uh, you know, what is the presentation of the baby or which one would seem more um, appropriate. And I mean, with the ultrasound um, intermittently, we will check fetal heart tones. Okay, now uh, what is macrosomia? So macrosomia in someone who is non-gestational diabetic is um, with basically birth weight greater than 5,000 uh, or 4,500 grams, excuse me. So greater than 4,500 grams is macrosomia? Yes. Now, you said you offered this patient an external cephalic version, and she declined it, correct? Yes. Why was she delivered at 40 and 6? I need to look back and remember the details of this patient, uh, this patient's presentation, but... Um, hmm. We usually schedule those C-sections anywhere between 39 and 40. So this this is definitely um, not a typical presentation. All right, let's stop there. <laughs> What'd you think? Uh, I don't. I didn't feel great about this, but <laughs> yeah, I think you did. You did okay. You did okay. Um, I think you're. I mean, you are an REI. They're not going to know that. So. <laughs> But I think you did well. You know, you knew your maneuvers. Mm -hmm. 
um, it's the Marceau Smelly Vit maneuver for the head. Mm -hmm. Now, you got to be cautious where the head gets stuck. The head can get stuck in two places, right? It can get mm -hmm. stuck in the cervix, and it's usually a, a, a preterm baby that does that usually. Or it's getting stuck in the uh, outlet tissue or the vaginal tissue. So that's usually where the piper helps because you're having problems flexing that head. And that's what the pipers do because you literally pull the pipers out and up, if I'm not mistaken, in order to flex that head appropriately. Am I making sense? Yes. Um, so the reason you do not uh, do a Dursens at 12 o'clock is you could um, that it, it could tear into the bladder, mm -hmm. right? Yes. If there's in the uterus, we can fix that. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. it, we can fix that. Um, so if you have uh, the cervix kind of contracted, you can give nitroglycerin. Okay. 50 mg IV every minute for a maximum of five doses. Of course, she can start bleeding after the delivery. Um, so those are some things there. Um, I think your presentation of uh, the external sulfatic version was good. Um, rupture of membranes and prior C-section are not contraindications. This is from um, up to date. Uh, a significant fetal or uterine anomaly or hyperextended fetal head are contraindications. Um, in regards to macrosomia, you know, the, I have to be honest, the practice bulletin is extremely vague when it comes to what is the uh, definition of macrosomia. At one point in that, uh, Practice bulletin is said it's 5,000 grams or 4,500 if you're diabetic. And in another place it says it's anybody that's 4,500 grams. So I'm, I'm kind of confused. That's all I can tell you. But it does uh, say those two things when I last reviewed that practice bulletin, unless they did an update. And that was uh, last year, I believe, when I last reviewed that particular practice bulletin. And please have a, an answer on why she got delivered at 40 and 6. Okay. Because I mean, she declined external cephalic version. She came in with rupture of membranes, and so be it. Okay. Other questions? Um, no, that was pretty good. Thank you. No worries. Good job. Thanks. All righty. So I'm just uh, going down the line. Anybody else here want to participate? Azra. Hi. Hi, how you doing? You want to participate or you have a question? I want to participate. Okay, anything in particular you're looking for? No, just uh, I wanted to give a heads up. I'm on call, so if I, okay. for whatever reason, have an emergency, I'll have to sign off. Okay. But, Are you a generalist? Yes. Or, okay. So let's try GYN, eh? Because we've tried everything okay. else. Okay. Okay, sure. Let me go look at your list here. You, you did turn in your list? Yes. Awesome. Give me a second here. Give me a second. The computer's popping it up. It's taking a bit. Sure, no problem. Sometimes I have to go back and do it again. I'm gonna make it short and sweet. 
Okay. Let me open up this here. So your case number one. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me the most common areas where your ureter can be damaged in a hysterectomy? Not necessarily vagin, okay? Okay, sure. Um, so I guess we can start at, um, I would say the one of the most common areas would be um, when you're taking your IP ligament. So um, when the ureter is kind of higher up in the pelvis, um, that can be one area um, that you can ligate the ureter. And then also you can ligate it at its, um, at its at where the junction is for it to come into the uh, bladder as that's uh, one to two centimeters away from the cervix. Um, and then the other thing I would say is you can also damage the ureter as you're taking your uterine arteries. Um, as it could also be in closer proximity there if you don't um, bring down your um, the broad leg of it. Um, I think those are, and then other than that, yeah, I think those are the three places I can think of the best. Is there any other areas that are more common? For the ureters? Um, mm -hmm. I guess if I'm looking at it from a vaginal uh, perspective, it's still when they come into where your um, cervix is. If I'm taking down, um, if I'm closing my cuff or if I'm taking, uh, like doing my McCall's coldoplasty, um, you can potentially kink the ureters um, when you uh, suture your um, cuff. So that's another place coming from a different perspective. Anything else? Not that I can think of at this moment. Okay, so can you please describe the course of the ureter in the pelvis? Sure, so um, the ureter is, starts at the, um, at the, um, at the kidney and um, the way I like to describe it is um, it's about 30 centimeters long with half of it being above um, the bifurcation of the aorta and the other half being below. Um, so it starts off at the renal pelvis and then it dives down um, and it crosses over the common iliacs at the, um, like I said, the bifurcation. Um, and then it uh, travels lateral to medial, and it comes on the medial leaf of the broad ligament, and then it dips down and um, comes in at an angle to the bladder about uh, two centimeters away from the cervix. The best way I can describe it. So does it pass this over or under the uterine artery? Under the uterine artery. And um, how does it enter within the paracervical tissue? Um, A specific area? At the trigone, near the trigone. So what has angle. a greater? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. I don't recall exactly how to describe that angle that it comes in at, but it would be it like kind of like a forty-five. Does it enter the cardinal? Does it enter the cardinal ligament? Um, yes, medially on the broad um, near the broad ligament. On the, what's that area called um, where it goes into the cardinal ligament? The ovarian fossa, I think. So what has, a sure risk of, that area. what has a greater risk of cuff dehiscence? A total uh, 
a total laparoscopic hysterectomy, or a TBH and why? I would say a total laparoscopic hysterectomy has a higher And why is that? Why is um, that? I think because you're using more, um, in my practice, I would assume it's more because the use of cautery um, in terms of when you are um, making your colpotomy versus um, when you are making your colpotomy um, vaginally, I, I usually do it sharply. Um, so maybe that would be one reason I could think of. Because you use cautery with a TLH? Correct. Any other reasons? No. So Not that I can think of. You have it. You did a modified macaw coldoplasty in this case. Um, yep. Explain to me how you do a macaw. Well, first, let me ask you, so, why do you do a macaw? Sure. So um, when you're doing a vaginal hysterectomy, and especially for this indication for the pelvic organ prolapse, I do want to ensure that she doesn't have um, uh, apical volt prolapse afterwards. Um, so um, I do want to ensure that I'm doing something for her, for her apical support. Um, and thus why I try to do the uh, McCall's coloplasty, where I'm going to take the uterosacral ligaments, and I'm going to make sure that my um, my cuff is um, is um, attached to the uh, uterosacrals um, at the apex to try to have some support in that regard. So you have here that the patient had pelvic organ prolapse. What was prolapsing? So interestingly, in her situation, it was a cervical. Well, it was a prolapsing fibroid that was coming out of her cervix, but she overall had a um, apical um, defect as well. So she had an apical defect. So you did a macaw to treat that apical defect? Um, yes, after removing her prolapsing cervical myoma as well. So what? Other options are available for management of vault prolapse. So you can do, um, and I personally don't do this. I would refer out for this, but you can do, um, you can do uterosacral ligament fixation. You can do a, um, as um, where you tack, and I'm, it's escaping me um, right now. But you can do a. Um, a surgery where basically you put a graft on the anterior and the posterior aspects of the um, of the bladder, uh, not, not the bladder, um, the actual uh, cuff, and you can pull that up to the, oh, sacral co copal pussy, sorry. Um, you can do that as well, and you just pull the apex up to the um, up to the, the bifurcation um, near the sacrum and you use that and you tack it up with the uh, with a mesh but I personally don't do this is there another procedure you can offer the patient for a, a you know suspension of the cuff so you could do the uterosacrals, you could do the sacral copal pexy, and then sacral spinous ligament fixation also. Okay. So what works better? The abdominal sacral copal pexy or the SSF? I think they have similar um efficacy results, but I cannot call, recall off the top of my head. So what are the pros and cons of each one, each each of those two methods? Um, the SSLF um, versus the sacral copal um, Yes. 
So I think for the SSLF, one of the, the cons is that you could potentially um, injure a nerve. Um, usually the pudendal and patients can possibly have pain and also... Any other, they, any other nerve could be affected? Um, I think there probably is, but I cannot recall right now. Okay, continue. Um, and then there's also a possibility of some blood loss. At, oh, um, the sciatic nerve, I think, as well. Um, okay. And there's a possibility of some blood loss um, due to the venous plexus that's in that area. Which venous um, plexus? The pudendal um, venous plexus. Okay, continue. Um, and then there is also, so that's the cons of that, um, but it is beneficial um, because you can do this from a vaginal point of view um, and versus the sacral copal plexi that can, that's more of an abdominal procedure or a possibly laparoscopic procedure. Um, and that involves having some kind of foreign object, which would be like the mesh to help um, elevate everything. So that could, that's one of the cons of it. Um, Is there any increased uh, risk of bleeding with the uh, sacral copal plexi? Yes, definitely, because you are having to, um, you are having to basically move another venous plexus and near the IVC um, where your sacrum is, and that could potentially cause a significant amount of bleeding. So discuss with me how you did the macaw coloplasty in this case. So in this case, um, I was able to secure my um, uh, uterosacral ligaments, and at the end of the procedure, when I were when after I had done the hysterectomy, when I was closing the cuff, I made sure to suspend the two apexes or the two um, lateral sidewalls of my cuff to the uh, uterosacral ligament, and then um, when I did my closure, I did a um, a closure of those sacral ligaments first and then close the cuff. Uh, so I'm still a little confused how you did that. So you have your uterosacral ligaments, you tag mm -hmm. them when mm -hmm. you ligated them, correct? Correct. Then what did you, and at the end of the case, you're, you're closing your cuff. What, I'm, not, I'm not quite clear. What, what did you do? So I basically tied them together um and then so in essence you got the two ends that you had tagged initially and you tied them together in the midline yes uh yes laterally so the lateral two i made sure that i took um, a significant bite of the um lateral uh, i guess aspects of my cuff closure um and then i so made you made sure that, sure was that your cuff angles included the mm -hmm. uterosacral correct that's exactly what i'm trying and to then say. after you did that you tied them off in the midline yes correct you don't think the patient would have pain um no you're you're placating something that is not in the midline to the midline um I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think it was essentially in that. Maybe it wasn't midline. Maybe it was more lateral. Um, and then I was able to close the cuff. So the, I felt like the support at that time was good. Um, no, but I'm just saying you either closure. you either you either tied them together in the midline or you didn't. I did. And you said earlier that you have a greater risk of ureteral kinking or ureteral damage with a macaw, correct? Correct. So why didn't you do a cystoscopy in this case? Um, I don't do universal cystoscopy. Um, I felt that in, in her case, um, my I felt confident in my closure that I was 
not at the lateral aspect of um, where I would be close to the um, ureters. But you, but you just said when you do the cuff angles, you are at greater mm -hmm. risk of injuring the ureter. You are, but I didn't feel like I did. So I but chose not to. Anytime you get a ure but anytime you get a ureteral injury, it's after the fact. Most of the time, nobody thought they had injured the ureter. Right, correct. That so is something that, I could have potentially done, but I did not. I felt confident at that time um, in terms of my anatomy. And you said this patient had symptomatic anemia, so she went to the operating room with a hemoglobin of 8.8? .8. Correct. Could you have done anything to increase that um, hemoglobin so we, before you took her to the operating room? Yes, we did try to put her on um, oral iron while um, in the office, and she was on um, oral iron, but did, she did have um, some issues with constipation, so compliance was also questionable. Um, and um, other than that, we could have given her a blood transfusion prior to, but um, we chose to wait until after she had had the hysterectomy and follow her um, CBCs. And if she continued to be symptomatic at that time, that's when we went ahead and gave her her blood transfusion. Would she have benefited from Lupron? She may have, but she at that moment um, had chosen not to do any other uh, management options. Um, she was persistently bleeding. Um, because of the prolapsing cervical myoma, and so we um, decided to proceed with surgery um, to stop it acutely instead of waiting three to six months um, while we give the loop on prior to doing this. Could you have easily taken her to the operating room, removed the cervical myoma vaginally, and left it at that? Would I have treated that problem? No. Um, the cervical myoma, um, it was prolapsing, however, um, there was significant amount of bleeding, and we did talk about this um, during her um, during her workup as well. That we could potentially just remove her prolapsing cervical myoma. However, the patient opted to have the hysterectomy due to her multiple other fibroids in her uterus as well. Well, you know, so how big was this cervical myoma? Um, I think uh, it was a good seven centimeters prolapsing out of her. What about the base? It was a very broad base. Um, I do have another case on my case list in, in which situation we had a similar thing where the, the base was not as broad and I did just ligate that off and not do a whole hysterectomy. But however, in this case, that was not possible um, even at the time of surgery. Um, it, it, it couldn't, it was too broad. And the the uterus weighed 534 grams. It was that Correct. big. Yes. Or was that the, just a fibroid? No, that was the entire uterus with the fibroid. We removed the fibroid, um, but it was only partially removed due to the broad base, and thus we had to remove the entire uterus with uh, additional multiple fibroids to be able to, um, uh, you know, do the hysterectomy as well. And you weren't concerned with the size of the uterus that you would run into problems in uh, getting the appropriate uh, bites of the pedicles so during the, the vaginal hysterectomy? That was something that I thought about. Um, however, we had done imaging prior to, um, and it did seem that like her it was more of a elongated and narrow uterus and not such a wide uterus, which is what um, made me feel confident that I could do this vaginally. Okay, let's stop there. Okay. What'd you think? I'm not sure. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um... The way you do a, a, a macaw and a utero, to my understanding, a macaw and a uterosacral ligament suspension are for prophylaxis of uh, vault prolapse. Mm -hmm. If you have a vault prolapse, 
you should do an SSF for treatment or a abdominal sacral copopex. Okay. Okay. The abdominal sacral copopex has a more successful rate. Okay. And you don't, it's not that you're going to run into the IVC, is you have the middle sacral artery and you have a small uh, vascularity plexuses in the sacrum because that's where you put the the mesh so then actually they have mm -hmm. bone wax that they recommend you put on these areas in order to stop the bleeding right i remember a watching con, a few in, a con is, is the but, mesh yeah. you have a foreign body so you yeah. can get bowel obstruction but of the okay. two procedures it is um the uh the one that's more successful uh, the sacral okay. spinous fixation or the SSF um, is actually you deviate it to one side or the other. And some people can do it bilaterally. Okay. And it's usually mm -hmm. a, a blind procedure. It's all by feel. And it's the uh, mm -hmm. pudendal uh, venous plexus. And that's where the pudendal nerve is and uh, uh, vascularity. Um, the sciatic mm -hmm. nerve is the one that can be damaged. Okay. So not anybody can do an SSF. You have to be well-versed in it. Right. Now, to do an, now the way you described your McCall, I don't think you have to do a, uterus, a, a cystoscopy. But I don't okay. know how beneficial that McCall was. Okay. In the sense of what a true McCall is. So what the McCall mm -hmm. does is you grab, before you, you close the, the, the vaginal cuff, cuff you mm -hmm. grab with an alice the uterosacral, you use a long delayed absorbable suture, grab the uterosacral and you reef it in the posterior aspect of the um, peritoneum and come out on the other um, uterosacral. You tag it and then you move up and do it again. And okay. you either do it two or three times. So okay, to say you that. just ligated it once, right? I don't know how good that is. I so, can see it better ligating two to three, and that's why you should do a cystoscopy because okay. you can grab the ureter instead of the uterosacral. Okay. All right. That makes and then sense. the difference between a McCall and a uterosacral ligament suspension is the McCall is not anatomical because okay. you ligate in the midline something that usually is not placated in the midline. Okay, so that now was kind of a trick question. Say again? Was that kind of a trick question then? No, I don't think so. No, okay. I don't think so. So if it's, it not was, something it was... that, oh, if it's not something that is, is done in the midline, how do, you, how do you do it then? That's the way you do a McCall. A true okay. McCall has to be ligated. You, you ligate them in the midline. That's a true McCall. Okay. Okay. But I don't know how much it's going to hold with just one suture. Right. I can see I it with two or saying. three. See what I'm saying? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then that's why some people are like, was well, the McCall any good? Because is there going to be a greater risk of pain because you're ligating, so mm -hmm. you're plicating in the midline something that is not usually plicated, while a uterosacral mm -hmm. does not plicate in the midline. Okay. You adhere yeah. the the you 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 adhere with sutures the uterosacral ligament to the um to the uh the the vaginal vault. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what if and, I wrote modified? Can I say that that's my modification? Yeah. And that yes. I, I don't do it that many. Yes, but times know how to do a real macaw. Okay. To be able to yeah. Them. Okay. Sounds good. At one point, you got me all confused. I, think I know I some people call myself modified too. McCall by just tying the uterosacral to the uh, cuff angle suture. Mm -hmm. That's their, their right. that's their uh, suspension, mm -hmm. which is not really a suspension. It's like a hope it works right. type of thing. Yeah. Um, and you have to stick to your guns in the sense of because the answer of why you took her to the operating room when you took her is because she had a prolapse in cervical myoma. She was bleeding. Right. Now you could have easily removed it if it mm -hmm. was easily removable. But it was a right. circular 
discussion to get to that point. So you need to defend why you did the case you did at the time mm -hmm. that you did it. If that okay. makes any sense. Yes. Um, I think I need to be more decisive. That's because yes. I keep saying maybe. And, you don't um, want to be cocky. Yeah. You don't want to be cocky. Yeah. But yeah. definitely you, you want to be decisive. And, you know, with practice, right. you get better at that. Being on the hot seat and stuff like that. Um, right. TLH has a greater risk of cuff dehiscence because of the cautery. Um, the magnification of the scope, you think you're getting good bites and you're not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, it's always better to suture with your hands so you may not get good okay. bites. Either. Okay. okay? Um, so the TBH has, the, I mean, they're, they're minuscule changes in percent, but definitely it's higher for robot cases that are robotic and TLH where you do not, you close the cuff with, uh, not with suture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and then what did you think of my, um, my description of the course of the ureter? So the course of the ureter. Because I thought what you said was fine, but then I'm like, well, she didn't say that how it went underneath the uterine artery. And mm -hmm. then it goes into the paracervical tissue, into the tunnel of the cardinal ligament, anterior bladder pillar, or the tunnel of Wortham. And that's an important tunnel or area for radical hysterectomies. Okay. I think I need yeah. to add that to my um, description. Okay. So the ureter is located one to two centimeters lateral to the cervix and uterosacral ligament. It courses immediately over the anterior vaginal fornix to enter the trigone in the posterior aspect of the bladder. But I thought what you said was good. Okay. Anything else? Should I pass it or fail that question? I mean, I never got asked that, but they're supposedly okay. that's one of those evil questions they can ask. Okay. okay. All right. Remember, who's much. testing your, your GYN, oncology and urogyn? So you got a, a call there. I can see it with pelvic organ prolapse. I can see them asking yeah. you stuff. Okay, that's good to Okay, know. but I think you did good. Good job. And it's a good Thank size you. uterus. So good on you. And the way you explained it, it was more narrow. I felt that we can do it. And you did. Okay. Oh, that's another thing. Yes. Please, everybody on the call. It's not we, it's I. I, 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 I did this. I did that. Mm -hmm. Never forget that. Okay. Okay. Great job. Thank you. Thanks. Um, does anybody have any questions about anything that we've done to this point? I see a question mark. Uh, Victory says you're self muted. Victory, are you there? Okay. Do you have a question, Sasha? You had a question? You had a question? I just, I just looked up the on up to the oh, yeah. sweet. Yep. It said that in the US the threshold is eight point four percent, although this approach um the screening may have merit or may not, but they just said in the US right now currently we're using eight point four percent. All right, so it's changed. All right, so there you are, 8.4. Okay, thanks. Perfect. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. I'm just looking down the line. Anybody have any questions? Amira has a question mark. Says you're self-muted. I can't unmute you, Amira. Uh, it still says you're self-muted. Still says you're self-muted. I see you raising your hand, Amira, but it keeps saying self self-muted. I'm sorry, I, I cannot unmute you. It says you are self-muted. Anybody else have any questions? I'm gonna go back to Amira here and I, I lost Victoria. They disappeared. 
Still says you're self-muted, Amira. All righty. I am so sorry. I cannot unmute you, Amira. And unfortunately, the chat uh, portion of asking questions uh, doesn't work in the, the webinar. So I cannot see what your questions were. I'm going to look down the line. Anybody else have any questions? I know we went over a little bit, but I think we went through a lot of topics, especially that the, the last, the vaginal hysterectomy with the prolapse and all that. I mean, again, a urogynecologist We'll be testing you, and I could see those type of questions being, you know, popping up. I know for a fact a uh, candidate had no prolapse on her case list. This was several years ago. Didn't have any prolapse on her case list um, at all, and she was specifically asked about the pop cue. So I'm going back to Amira here. Still says that you are self-muted, Amira. I'm so sorry. If you had a question, I cannot answer it for you. My apologies. So I'm looking down the list. Um, if anybody has any questions. Sasha, you have your hand up. I'm assuming it was from before. Oh, sorry. Before. Yeah. Sasha, you have a question. All right, cool. Sorry, that was from yep. before. No worries. So I don't see anybody else with their hand up. Any questions? I'm going to try again with Amira. And Amira's microphone's completely gone now. So I don't, I don't think I'll be able to help her. Oh, okay. I see you. Okay. Now I got some questions here. It says, can you repeat? Are you there, Amira? Raise your hand. Can you, all right. Cool. So can you repeat the course of the ureter again? Okay. I'm going to read it out to you. So the ureter runs along the anterior surface of the psoas muscle to the pelvic brim. The ureter enters the pelvis at the bifurcation of the common iliac artery. It descends retroperitoneally on the lateral pelvic wall and runs posterior to the ovary. As it descends through the pelvis, its course becomes more medial. It is identified on the medial leaf of the broad ligament. It passes under the uterine artery. So you have that, remember the quote, water under the bridge and into the paracervical tissue, into the tunnel of the cardinal ligament slash bladder, anterior bladder pillar, or the tunnel of Wortham. The ureter is located one or two centimeters lateral to the cervix and uterosacral ligaments. It courses immediately over the anterior vaginal fornix to enter the trigone in the posterior aspect of the bladder. Does that answer your question, Amira? Raise your hand. Very good, thank you. And then I do see that Victoria said in the osteoporosis ACOG practice advisory, the 10-year risk of major osteoporotic fracture of 8.4% would necessitate a DEXA prior to the age of 65. So uh, I know Sasha brought that information up to our attention as well. Okay, so thank you. I, I just figured out how you could see the questions. I don't know how I did that, but it worked. So very good. Been doing these for a couple of years and now I learned something new. So very good. Um, other questions before we end the call? I'm sorry we went over, but I think we went over some good topics, um, some very important topics. I'm just looking down the line. Any other questions? No, I don't see any other questions. Thank you so much for the individuals who participated, Sasha, Pardis, and... Um, I'm gonna say your name wrong, Azara. Um, you guys did a great job. Um, and we're, we're trying as hard as we can to include everybody in the hot seat and give everybody the time they need um, in order to prepare well for the exam. Cause I know we have many people who are taking the exam coming up here in November. So that is just around the corner. Again, one more check for any questions. I don't see any. Again, thank you so much. Wait, hold on. I may have seen something here. No, it was my imagination. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for participating and staying on the call. My apologies for um, that technical snafu, but we had it, got everything back on track. And um, we have another webinar, which would be uh, structured cases tomorrow. So I hope everybody has a good rest of the night and have a good week. Thank you so much. <laughs>